Hi, welcome to Digging to China. I'm Dong Xiong. Thank you for tuning in. Your support means the world and plays a crucial role in the YouTube algorithm. Liking, sharing, and subscribing not only show your support, but also help YouTube recommend my videos to a broader audience. Thank you very much. In the past few days, major Chinese A-share listed banks have all released their financial reports for 2023. Interestingly, these reports contain a wealth of information. Typically, in times of economic prosperity, bank financial reports appear impressive. But during economic downturns, the situation reverses with raising bad debts and falling profits for major banks. Thus, despite the bold assertions by the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs about the robust state of the economy, the banking sector's financial reports serve as a stock reality check. This video aims to explore the surprising revelations hidden within the 2023 financial reports of the Chinese banking industry. To begin with, China's GDP purportedly rose by 5.2% in 2023. Despite the well-known economic challenges of the previous year, the Communist Party refuses to acknowledge them, consistently painting a picture of unfaltering progress. However, when the real economy falters, bank profits tend to suffer as well, as banks are intertwined with the real economy. Consequently, the net profits of A-share-listed banks in 2023 only saw a modest increase of 1.8%, a noticeable decline from 2022. Furthermore, this profit figure was achieved through a series of financial maneuvers aimed at artificially boosting the results. Let's illustrate this with two of China's strongest banks, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China ICBC, among state-owned banks, and China Merchants Bank CBM, CMB, I'm sorry, among commercial banks. Despite ICBC's revenue dropping by 3.7% to 8,431 billion yuan last year, its net profit attributable to the parent company still rose by 0.8%. How did that manage this. The strategy is straightforward. By reducing various asset impairment losses and provisions, a common financial tactic in the banking industry. When profits are too high and needed to be tempered, banks can increase provisions. Conversely, when profits are less impressive, they can decrease provisions to improve the appearance of profits. The same approach was observed with the CMB. Despite a revenue decline, CMB's net profit continued to rise, achieved through similar adjustments to provisions, boosting the bottom line. Furthermore, it's noteworthy that the major listed banks are concurrently tightening their belts, including measures like cutting employee salaries, downsizing, and trimming various operational expenses. Such actions are common during economic downturns in the banking sector. As bank profits dwindle, it's, it's natural for employee benefits to diminish as well. However, it's often observed that the employees of state-owned banks receive relatively better treatment compared to those in commercial banks, where layoffs and salary cuts tend to be more pronounced. This disparity stems from the inherent traits of state-owned banks, which still retain certain features of the traditional collective welfare system. Despite these measures, the employee count in state-owned banks has decreased. For example, ICBC saw a reduction of over 8,000 employees in 2023 compared to 2022, mainly from counter and back office positions. Currently, major banks are increasing frontline sales personnel while significantly reducing back office and counter staff. This reflects efforts to reduce costs and enhance efficiency because frontline staff generate the profits while back office personnel add to the cost burden without directly contributing to profits. Therefore, from the bank's perspective, it's preferable to have more staff engaged in revenue-generating activities and fewer staff in administrative roles. Although state-owned banks are also implementing layoffs, the salary stability of the six major state-owned banks remains intact, with no significant decrease. Conversely, employees of commercial banks have experienced notable salary reductions. 
For instance, employees of commercial banks such as Ping An, Citic, Mingsheng, and Everbright have all witnessed a decrease in average salaries compared to 2022. The most extreme case is China Merchants Bank, which has disclosed in its financial reports for two consecutive years that it is reclaiming salaries from its employees. In 2023 alone, China Merchants Bank reclaimed a total of 43 million yuan in salaries from 4,415 employees, averaging about 10,000 yuan per person. Over the two-year period of 2022 and 2023, China Merchants Bank has reclaimed over 100 million yuan in salaries from its employees. It's crucial to clarify that when analyzing bank financial reports and encountering figures regarding employee salaries, it's not simply in indicative of the employee gross income. Instead, it represents the bank's overall labor cost. Let me provide an example to illustrate this. Consider China Merchants Bank, which appears to have the highest average employee salary among banks and aggressively retrieves salaries from its employees. In 2023, the average employee salary at CMB was over 600,000 yuan. However, this doesn't imply that employees' pre-tax average income reaches this high. The actual income is not particularly high and the welfare benefits are rather average. The figure of 600,000 yuan actually reflects the cost incurred by CMB to maintain an average employee. Apart from covering contributions like social security, there are various other expenses involved in supporting employees. This includes costs for annual training sessions, maintaining employee cafeterias throughout the year, and purchasing new uniforms. While these expenses might seem insignificant individually, they collectively represent a significant portion of the budget. China Merchants Bank, for example, invests heavily in retail training program, often bringing external experts at considerable costs. For instance, if CMB pays an external training institution 10 million yuan for a session, with 5 million yuan being retained by CMB higher-ups, the entire expense still falls under the umbrella of employee maintenance costs. Additionally, expenses related to cafeteria procurement can also present lucrative opportunities for those responsible for purchasing. Here is another intriguing fact for you all. Did you realize that the bank uniforms can cost several thousand yuan per set? And when you factor in the need for different sets for each season, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, the expenses quickly add up. These uniforms are tailor-made by reputable clothing manufacturers and are usually replaced every two years. Considering the significant investment in clothing, one might question whether these uniforms truly warrant such high costs or if there is someone profiting from the arrangement. I believe we all have a pretty good idea of the answer. When all these miscellaneous expenses are piled up, it becomes evident that why the employee salary figures in the financial reports appear so high. However, in reality, the actual take-home pay for bank employees might be decreasing. So, let's not hastily resent the bank employees for their seemingly high salaries. The frontline workers in banks are not highly paid. They are essentially financial laborers, just like everyone else, subject to exploitation and squeezing for profit. Following our discussion on bank profits, let's now delve into the issue of deposits and examine the extent of the wealth disparity in China. Bank deposit data can provide valuable insights, particularly when examining figures from Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, the largest state-owned bank. With over 15,000 branches nationwide, ICBC serves a staggering 740 million individual clients, representing more than half of China's population. These clients collectively hold personal financial assets totaling 21 trillion yuan, translating to an average of just 28,000 yuan per person. 
Turning our attention to ICBC's private banking segment, they cater to 262,900 clients with financial assets totaling 3 trillion yuan, averaging 11.68 million yuan per person. This reveals a significant wealth distribution pattern. 99.96% of individual clients hold a 85% of the total wealth, while the remaining 0.036% of private banking clients possess 15% of the wealth. This distribution closely mirrors the wealth gap among the country's residents. Let's also compare this with data from China Merchants Bank, known as the top performer in retail banking nationwide, with branches mainly situated in urban areas. This provides insight into the wealth disparity among urban residents in China. As of the end of 2023, CMB had 196 million individual clients with total assets reaching 13.3 trillion yuan, averaging 67,500 yuan per person. Among them, 4,640,000 golden sunflower clients with assets at least half a million yuan, collectively held a total asset of 10.8 trillion yuan, averaging 2.33 million yuan per person. This reveals that 2.36% of golden sunflower clients possess 81% of the wealth, while the remaining 97.64% of the ordinary individuals together hold only 19% of the wealth. It seems to deviate from the commonly understood Pareto principle, also known as the 80-20 rule, where 20% of the population typically holds 80% of the wealth. According to the data provided by China Merchants Bank, it suggests that only 2% of the population holds 80% of the wealth. It's essential to note that the CMB's data reflects urban wealth distribution and excludes the vast impoverished rural areas. However, even focusing solely on urban wealth disparity, China's situation appears more severe than that of the United States. While the U.S. also faces significant wealth inequality issues, data indicates that the top 10% of the wealthy individuals hold 70% of the wealth, which is relatively less extreme than in China. In recent years, there has been significant attention on the data concerning China Merchants Bank's private banking clients. However, in the 2023 annual financial report, CMB made the unprecedented decision to withhold information regarding the assets of its private banking clients. This move is likely aimed at avoiding sparking public discussions about the wealth distribution. Certainly, the data regarding China merchant banks' private banking clients stands out significantly compared to that of Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. By the end of third quarter last year, the average asset per private banking client at CMB exceeded 28 million yuan, more than double that of the ICBC. In the current economic downturn where everyone is facing hardship, the further enrichment of the wealthy undoubtedly exacerbates social tensions. However, in China, this is an unfortunate reality. During economic downturns, wealth tends to concentrate in the hands of fewer individuals when the number of common people is insufficient, the ones in power now find themselves in a subordinate position. It can be likened to the transition from being the sickle to becoming the leeks, while only the red elites remain as the sickle generation after generation. Essentially, China's banking sector serves as the sickle wielded by the red auto aristocracy to harvest the leaks. If the leaks are harvested too harshly, the bank's financial reports suffer. Let's focus on China Merchants Bank again. CMB is well known for its outstanding performance in retail banking and leads the nation in wealth management services. While other banks struggle to make profit in their credit card operations, CMB's credit card services stand out as highly profitable, which is quite remarkable. However, in 2023, even CMB's efforts couldn't stimulate consumer activity. Why? Because people were simply not interested anymore. They preferred to deposit their money quietly without engaging in financial planning, purchasing insurance, buying funds, or investing in various opportunities. They also avoided using credit cards for advancing spending. Consequently, CMB experienced a decline in fee and commission income across its services. 
including a decrease in the profitability of its credit card business. These are all straightforward evidence indicating that Chinese individuals are becoming increasingly conservative with waning desires for both investment and consumption. This is a typical display of diminished confidence among people during economic deflation. Many individuals tend to question the credibility of China's bank financial reports. For example, the non-performing loan ratio is often suspected of being inaccurately low. However, when we say artificially low, we don't mean that the numbers are entirely fabricated. Rather, Various methods are employed to achieve this result. Therefore, it's important to understand that the figures in bank financial reports are genuine, but they may undergo adjustments using technical methods. For instance, as mentioned earlier, reducing provisions can inflate profits. Similarly, there are numerous techniques to lower the non-performing loan ratio. Certainly, it's a fact that the non-performing loans are included in the total loan volume. The figures regarding a bank's deposits, loans, and customer numbers are difficult to manipulate. Therefore, when analyzing this data, the conclusions drawn are generally accurate and dependable. Bank financial reports are particularly insight for indicators of economic conditions. During periods of economic growth, banks tend to see a rise in revenue and significant profits. Conversely, during economic downturns, banks may face challenges such as declining revenue and profits or an uptick in non-performing loans. In the realm of domestic banking in China, China Merchants Bank's strategic emphasis on retail banking stands out as astute. This approach serves to effectively mitigate its own risks. Despite facing various revenue-related challenges, a bank predominantly centered on retail banking is unlikely to incur substantial amounts of non-performing loans. Generally, Personal uh, customers can only borrow a few million at the most, and rarely tens of millions. Conversely, banks primarily focused on corporate operations may face significant losses due to risks in specific industries. For instance, in the current scenario of upheaval in the real estate sector, any bank heavily reliant on real estate investments is bound to encounter adverse consequences. In the 2023 financial reports of the banking sector, one unlucky bank stands out, China Everbright Bank. During the fourth quarter of the previous year, China Everbright Bank experienced a significant 60% drop in net profit. This decline was primarily attributed to the over-reliance on its loan business, which led to the emergence of certain risks. While other banks were reducing provisions and allocations, China Everbright Bank had to go against the trend by increasing these provisions and allocations in the fourth quarter. This suggests that they likely had numerous non-performing loans that couldn't be resolved, leaving them unable to prioritize profit adjustments. With the deteriorating Chinese economy, smaller banks, aside from state-owned ones, are at a higher risk of collapsing sooner. Even among nationwide joint stock banks, a few are expected to fold, leading to a significant restructuring of the banking sector. Thank you for watching. Please like, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly. Until then, be well.